The next kind of locking we want to consider is using the load linked store conditional instructions. Now this is an attempt to improve over TTSL. TTSL is already better than TSL, but the problem with bus-based locking is you need a bus, and in large multiprocessors you don't have a shared bus. Also, bus-based locking is not scalable with fine-grained locks. Do you remember that when we covered parallelizing linked data structures, we said that in order to get the greatest parallelism you'd only lock one node at a time? This is called fine-grain locking because each dock locks a very small piece of data. If you tried to do this over a bus, you'd be in trouble because every lock and unlock anywhere in the system ties up the bus and thereby delays all other references to shared memory. But it should be possible for different threads to lock different data structures at the same time without interference. If we want to do that, we can't use a bus. Suppose we could lock a cache line instead of a bus. This would solve the problem of serialization, but it's not easy to achieve it. Cache blocks are being read and written all the time. If a block is locked, the read or write can't proceed. Either we have to make it wait, or we have to make the process retry it later. That's called a negative acknowledgement, or a knack. A way around the problem is to not really lock a cache block, but make it behave as if it were locked. Upon a read reference, we load a word into the cache. We then monitor that location, and if it happens to get overwritten before we're done with it, we cancel the pending star and make the process that read the word go back and re-execute the code, beginning with the read of the word that was just overwritten. In order to do this, we need two new instructions. The first is called load linked, or LL. It reads a word from memory and stores the address of that word in a special LL register. And that register is cleared if anything happens that may break atomicity. So if a context switch occurs, then we can't keep track of what's going on with that word, so we just cancel the load. Or another thing, if the block containing the address in the LL register is invalidated. So if the block is invalidated, then we've got to clear the LL register, and that means that ultimately we're going to have to go back and re-execute the load. The store conditional instruction tests whether the address in the LL register matches the store address. So we cached this block because we wanted to modify a lock variable. And if we actually modify it before any of these events happens to interrupt what we're doing, then the store succeeds and the store goes to cache and then ultimately to memory. Otherwise, the store fails and it's canceled and zero is returned. And so if that happens, then you're going to have to go back and try again. So the code looks like this. It's got a double loop just like the code for TTSL did. In the first loop, we're waiting for R1 to become zero so we can enter the lock. So we load lockvar into R1 and then check to see if it's zero. If it is zero, then we can go through. Otherwise, we branch back up to the top of the loop. And then if it was zero, we come through and now we can set the lock. We do this by adding one to R1. R1, of course, was zero. So this makes R1 become one. Now the reason we do the add here is because we have to generate a one somehow. When we use test and set, we would simply read a value in memory and if it was one, we'd leave it alone. But now we're going to have to actually store the one back into memory, so we need to generate it by using the add instruction. And then we attempt to store this one back into lock variable. And if nothing has happened to change the value in that LL register, the, the store will succeed and we will just execute the next instruction and not branch, and then we will return to the caller having locked the lock. On the other hand, if something did happen to the lock while we were in between the, the load linked and store conditional, then a zero is going to be put in R1, and we'll branch back up to the lock label and re-execute the code. So we'll keep working until we know that we have gotten that lock and nobody else has touched that lock variable in the interim between the time we looked at it and we actually saved it. 
Unlock is, as always, trivial. All you do is write a zero with an ordinary write instruction to lock variable and then return. Let's compare the two loops in the LLSC co code with the two loops in the TTSL code. Notice that the first loop is identical, except for the fact that the LD instruction over here is replaced with an LL instruction. The second loop is also similar to, to its TTSL counterpart, except here an add instruction is used instead of a test and set to set R1 to 1. Now the SC will succeed if no invalidation has occurred. That means if no other thread tried to write to that block, then we know that this thread is the only one that's been touching it because any other thread that made a change would have to get the block in modified state and that would require invalidating this copy. And so if R1 was set to zero, all we need to do is branch back to the beginning of the lock code and try again. Now let's take a look at the trace of execution, which is in the bottom pane here, and we want to compare it with TTSL, whose trace is in the upper pane. Notice first of all that the states in all three caches are exactly the same in each trace. Then notice that the bus actions are exactly the same in each, in each trace. And the instructions are certainly similar, but the LDs in the TTSL trace are replaced by LLs in the LLSC trace, and the test and sets in the TTSL trace are replaced by store conditionals in the LLSC trace. So there's similar bus traffic in both traces because there's the same bus operations. Actually, I should say that in the LLSC trace, you would have reads and upgrade trans network transactions rather than bus transactions, because most of the time you wouldn't be using a bus. But in any event, the transactions are the same. Successful lock acquisition involves two bus transactions. Which two transactions, in order, have to occur in order to acquire a lock? But the advantage of this is that unlike test and set, which always requires a bus transaction, SCs only generate a transaction, a network transaction in this case, if they succeed. A failed SC, one where you tried to do the right but found that the lock and link register had been changed underneath you, that, that does not generate a bus transaction. Now this is advantageous in performance because SCs don't fail often. Why don't they fail often? For all of its advantages, LLSC does have some limitations. The first is if you have a lot of threads contending to enter the critical section. Let's say as soon as one thread enters and leaves the critical section, then it comes back to compete for entry again. In this case, every time each of the threads acquires the lock once, you have order P attempts to acquire the lock. Each release, assuming that all the other threads are waiting, invalidates order P caches, which causes order P subsequent cache misses the next time that processor tries to acquire the lock. So since you have order P misses for each of the P transactions that try to enter the lock, each critical section causes order P squared bus traffic, which in a big system is a lot. Another limitation is fairness. There's no guarantee that a thread that contends for a lock gets it, you know, ahead of all the threads that didn't start contending until later. The threads can acquire the lock in any order, and there's no expectation that a thread that had been waiting a longer time would acquire it before a thread that has requested it more recently. In the next couple of videos, we're going to address this by looking at two different kinds of locks.